So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's very first class. It's a chilly morning, a beautiful day. We want to learn about a beautiful, beautiful protocol known as MPLS, uh, multi-protocol label switching, uh, MPLS. Whenever I teach this topic, I like starting with a funny story uh, uh, that I was told by one of my colleagues. So a few years ago, uh, uh, about like uh, six years ago or something, so this colleague of mine was doing, uh, uh, they were doing Cisco, uh, and they were being trained with uh, this um, Zungu lady. So one of the topics that uh, was a little bit newer that, uh, that time was MPLS. And uh, uh, it was quite a task, understanding how it works and also configuring it. Eh? So this Mzungu lady used to drive a CLS Mercedes Benz. And uh, she used to actually tell them that uh, you cannot drive a CLS if you cannot configure MPLS. So what she was doing was to try and paint a picture to these guys uh, on how much it pays uh, for you to become an MPLS uh, consultant. So that time, internet service provider companies were paying quite a lot. It's still a hot cake on the market. But of course, it works hand in hand also with what we call segment routing at the moment. So this is a topic that I love and I hope that you're going to understand it. So I want to quote and quote that lady that you cannot drive a CLS if you cannot be able to configure an MPLS. So let's look at MPLS and see what it's able to do. So this course introduces the MPLS architecture that contains two planes, the MPLS encapsulation mode and the label format. So the process of MPLS data forwarding is the key point of this course. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to. Alan, can you hear me? You've been quiet for a while. Can you help us read these objectives? Okay, it seems Alan is not with us. Anyone else, a volunteer? Just unmute your mic and go ahead. ...of MPLS and describe the process of MPLS data forwarding. Okay, I only had the last one, but it's okay. Asante Sana, who is this? Sure. Joshua, Sante San, I think your internet yeah. maybe or my, my side has a problem. So let's begin with the MPLS uh, overview. Now, before we look at uh, MPLS, we need to revisit and understand how we forward data traditionally using the IP header. So in chapter eight, you looked at the data forwarding scenario. And the data forwarding scenario was simply trying to lay out how data is processed at the data link layer, uh, how that same data is processed at the network layer, and finally, how data forwarding is done at the transport layer. So generally, it is the, it is the information uh, uh, of protocols in these layers that are used to transfer data from the source to the destination. Uh, the upper layer protocols are simply used to format data. Uh, the lower layer protocol, which is the physical layer, is simply used to, uh, 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 to, to actually place the data on the physical uh, or on the particular media that you're using to transport data. But generally, at the data link layer, we process and forward data based on the MAC address. Based on the MAC address. When it comes to the network layer, we look at the IP address. And when it comes to the transport layer, uh, depending on whether you're using TCP or UDP, then you'll be talking of ports. Mm. 
So these are some of the details that are actually used to, to forward data. So let's look at this particular example. Now, a packet, a packet is supposed to be sent to this destination. So from the 10.1.0.0 slash 24 network to the 10.2.0.0 slash 24 network. So uh, the device in that particular network will, uh, will, will form that particular packet and deliver it to its gateway, which is the router here, RTA. So that particular packet is going to look like this. In it, on the IP header, it's going to have the destination. It's going to have the destination IP address. Uh, now, when the router, when the router receives this particular data, the first thing it processes is the data link layer header. Uh, so it checks, is, does my MAC address match this particular interface? So if it matches, then it opens up uh, 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 by looking at the, the type field on the data link layer header. Uh, so the ethernet header, it looks at the type field. Then sees that I'm supposed, the next protocol that is supposed to be processed on this particular packet is the IP, is the IP protocol. So it's gonna pass it up to the network layer. Now, when it, uh, when it passes it to the network layer, now the router will see, am I, am I the destination? Am I the destination? Mm. Does this IP on the destination header match my own IP address? If yes, then it's gonna pass that data to the transport layer so that the port numbers can be evaluated. If not, the router is going now to do this. The router is going to check its IP forwarding table, what we call the routing table. It's gonna check the routing table. So in the routing table, it's trying to check, hey, do I know this network? Do I know this network? 10.2.0.0 slash 24. Do I know it? So how does it check? In its routing table, it has a number of entries. So it goes checking one by one, one by one, until it finds it. If it does not find it, then it discards this packet. Uh, it simply discards it. So I, I can't forward you because I'm not aware of, uh, of that network. I don't know where to forward you to next. Otherwise, if it finds it, like in this case, where we have the last entry here, it simply checks in the IP routing table, we have the next stop. So if I'm to forward a packet towards this network, where am I supposed to send it? I'm supposed to send it to this next stop. This next stop, I've actually been interconnected to it, which is this one here, 10.1.1.2. So that particular interface on RTB. So it's gonna forward that packet uh, out through its interface to this particular router. This router again will process the data link layer, check the network layer, sees that it's not the destination and therefore begin checking again. Through its, uh, through its routing table, find the next stop when, when it finds it and forwards it to the next stop. In this case, this particular interface, 10.1.1.6. This guy will do, uh, similarly, will check the routing table, find that particular network, forward it to the next stop, 10.1.1.10, like that. So this particular interface here. Now with the IP address 10.1.1.10. RTD on the other hand, will also check after processing the data link layer, it will check, find it there, then look at the next stop. So where am I supposed to forward it to? I'm supposed to forward it out through my own interface. This one here, 10.2.0.2. So this guy is simply going to deliver it to this network. And therefore, that particular device that is interconnected in this network is going to actually receive that particular packet. So in summary, that is how the traditional IP forwarding actually happens. Now, a few things, a few things to note.
about the traditional uh, uh, about the traditional IP forwarding is number one, the forwarding efficiency, uh, the forwarding forward forwarding efficiency efficiency is low. So that is number one. Number two, uh, it is connection. It is connectionless oriented. It is connectionless oriented. Because it is connectionless oriented, it is hard to deploy what we call quality of service because it's connectionless oriented. So as you're going to see with MPLS, MPLS can be connection oriented. Connection oriented meaning we can be able to specify a path uh, 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 that a packet will follow. Hmm. Connectionless oriented means that uh, this guy is simply going to use the routing protocols to determine the next path. So here, whatever update is in the routing table has been done using a routing protocol to determine this particular next hop. Uh, so you cannot manually determine the path via which a packet will follow to the destination. Uh, but using MPLS, using segment routing, we can be able to do that. When you're able to specify the path through which a packet can follow, then you are able to control uh, 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 quality of service by doing traffic engineering. So you can optimize. Oh, Poleni Sana, I was kicked out by my, my poor network connection. Poleni Sana, can you hear me guys? Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear it. Okay, so where was I? Before I was unceremoniously thrown out of my meeting. Where, where, where had I reached? What's the last statement you had me say? I think you were talking about the, the way MPLS is uh, connection-oriented. Mm, something I think mm. that's the last part. Okay, say. okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, a traditional IP forwarding is connectionless because uh, uh, Every router processes a packet independently, and we cannot really determine the path via which a packet can follow to the destination. So we cannot do what is called traffic engineering. But with MPLS, that is made possible. Mm -hmm. Because with traditional IP forwarding, it adapts a hope by hope forwarding, uh, router by router, depending on uh, 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 the best route that has been determined that has been determined using uh, the routing protocol. Now, we have what is called ATM, or a synchronous transfer mode. Uh, I really don't want to delve into this because there is a topic which, which used to be called frame relay that was there in the version 2.2. So you would have understood this better if, uh, if we had done frame relay, but we didn't. So I really don't want to delve into this so much, but when you find time, please YouTube, search on YouTube about ATM so that you have some basics. Uh, but just the basic overview is that with the, uh, with the ATM, it forwards data based on uh, what we call virtual circuits, virtual circuits using an ATM switch. Uh, so, I really don't want to go uh, deep into this, as I mentioned earlier. Just find time and, and go through it. Otherwise, my part in this particular chapter is to take you through MPLS. So MPLS again, MPLS is what we refer to as multi-protocol. Multi-protocol label, label switching multi-protocol label switching. Hmm. Now, we know that routers forward data based on the IP address. Hmm. But now, in what we call an MPLS domain, we want the routers to forward data not 
based on the IP header, but based on an MPLS header, which uses labels to forward data. Mm. Which uses labels to forward data. Just like layer two devices, switches. Mm. See the way switches forward data uh, based on the, uh, on the MAC address and the port number. So here, we, we want something like that. Mm. Initially, this was done in order to, uh, uh, to improve the forwarding efficiency of routers. Uh, but due to the improved processing powers of routers nowadays, uh, 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 forwarding, improving forwarding efficiency is not the only outright advantage of MPLS over traditional IP forwarding. Because with the current processing power, uh, routers can, can forward uh, uh, as fast uh, using the IP header as they can using MPLS. But now other benefits of MPLS is they can support traffic engineering, improve quality of service, and therefore optimize uh, uh, network services. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 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 MPLS adopts what we call a connectionless control plane it adopts a connectionless connectionless uh, control plane and a connection oriented connection oriented data plane uh, so what does this mean mm. The connectionless oriented, the connectionless oriented control plane implements routing transmission and label distribution. So sharing the labels between the routers is done on the connectionless control plane. Mm. Just like I've explained connectionless when we are forwarding using IP. So label distribution is done on the connectionless control plane. On the other hand, data is forwarded over the connection-oriented data plane uh, using what you call uh, a label switched path, a label over a label switched path in the MPLS domain. Mm. So, just as a just as a as a summary here. Uh, when routers are forwarding data based on the MPLS header, we, we, we refer to that particular area as an MPLS domain. In an MPLS domain, uh, the packet will have, of course, the data. The packet will also have the IP header, but you're not going to use the IP header to forward the data. And the packet is also going to have, most importantly, the MPLS header, which is going to specify the labels, uh, 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 which is going to determine how that particular packet is going to be forwarded in the MPLS, within the MPLS domain. Mm. This use of labels to forward packets greatly improves the forwarding efficiency. It greatly improves the forwarding efficiency. So let's look at a few other things about MPLS. Okay, so uh, this is just an animation of how it happens. So you've received a packet from a traditional IP forwarding network. So the packet has, of course, the data and the IP header. So once the router receives that packet, and then uh, it adds a label to it, for example, 1024. Mm. So it adds an MPLS header with a label 1024, then forwards it to RTB. Before RTB uh, sends out that particular packet, it changes the label value to 1029, forwards it to RTC. RTC receives it, changes the label value to 1039, then forwards it to RTD. RTD removes the label, uh, removes the label, and forwards it to uh, uh, the traditional uh, IP forwarding network. 
without the MPLS header. Uh, so we only forward using the MPLS header within the MPLS domain. But when we are sending out the packet to any network that is not within the MPLS domain, then we forward using the IP, the IP header. And we make sure to remove uh, 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 that this particular uh, MPLS label header. So in the coming slides, you're going to understand the role of each of these routers. You're going to understand the role of each of these routers in the MPLS domain. Now, as I said, the processing powers of routers has greatly improved over the years, and therefore, uh, 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 forwarding efficiency is not is not the only advantage. Is not the only advantage of MPLS over uh, over the traditional forwarding. One other advantage of MPLS is that MPLS can be used uh, uh, can be used to implement traffic engineering, virtual private networks, and also quality of service. Uh, well, and some of these things are almost impossible when you're just using pure pure IP. Uh, so these are some of the advantages really of MPLS. So this particular example is uh, an example that shows uh, how, for example, you can be able to create VPNs within an MPLS domain. So here we have VPN A, we have VPN B, uh, and so on and so forth. And therefore, through this particular uh, MPLS domain, you can be able to connect disparate sites. For example, the headquarter and a branch via the MPLS domain. Uh, so you can create VPNs within this particular within this particular domain. So for example, from there to here, and you can actually specify the path through which that particular packet will pass through to the destination, like that, something like that. Uh, so these are some of the uh, notable advantages of, uh, of MPLS. Now, uh, remember yesterday I mentioned that even though at the edge of the MMU network, we have a router that is sitting in one of our server rooms. That router is not ours. Uh, I mentioned that yesterday when we were talking about IPsec VPN. Uh, that router is not ours. So the router normally belongs to the ISP. Our ISP is Kennet. So all these routers here, all these routers here belong to the same internet service provider. Now, in uh, in terms of the in terms of the routers and the role they play, uh, routers are given different uh, different names. So let me just call it, for example, ISP routers. Uh, so we we have what we call the customer the customer edge router. The customer edge router is that router that connects to the customer uh, and lies within the customer's premise. So for example, that router that is in our server room at Multimedia University. Then we have another router that is called the provider, the provider, the provider edge router. Uh, this one, uh, so this one is, is commonly referred to as a CE, this one is referred to as a PE, provider edge router. Then lastly, we have the provider, the provider router, which is commonly referred to as a P. So this one, this one sits, sits at MMU, sits at Multimedia University of Kenya. Uh, this one sits at Kennet, and is used to directly interconnect with the customer edge router. Then the provider edge router sits at Kennet and is, does not connect directly to the customer, but is used to interconnect different provider edge routers. So these are some of the roles that routers that are owned by an ISP actually play. 
So for example, in this particular case, in this particular case, for example, you, you, you can get that uh, this, is, this is a router at MMU main campus. This is a router at MMU Nairobi city center campus. This is another router at MMU Mombasa campus. And this is another router at MMU Kisumu campus. So you've created a VPN so that you can enable communication uh, between all these between all these uh, uh, branches, so that if 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 here in the main campus you have a uh, you, you have an IP phone, you have an IP phone, then you can be able to call you can be able to call uh, this guy at Nairobi City Campus uh, as if you are within the same network. So those are some of the of, of the powers that VPNs give us, for instance, and MPLS in particular. So let's look at more concepts around VPNs. Now, oh, so something else to, to mention here. So of course, it is important to mention that the MPLS domain, the MPLS domain most of the time is created within, uh, within the, uh, the ISP's domain. Uh, or premise. So with these other routers, the customer edge routers, uh, most of the time they simply forward data uh, based on the IP header. So they don't forward based on, based on MPLS. So it's also important for you to, to realize that. Okay. So the other application of MPLS is what we call traffic engineering. Uh, traffic engineering uh, enables you to create a tunnel via which traffic will flow within the MPLS domain. So if, if, if you're having uh, network A here, you can be able to configure and say that 70% of the traffic, 70% of the traffic from this particular network We'll go through RTB, then RTC, then RTD, and then RTE, then to the internet. You can also be able to configure and say that 30% uh, of traffic from there will go through RTA, then RTB, then RTG, then RTH, then there, then there, then to the internet. So that is what we call traffic engineering. Uh, so traffic engineering really helps to ensure that, for example, we don't have congestion in particular nodes. Uh, because sometimes when we are using, uh, when you're simply using routing protocols to determine the forwarding path, we can have congestion. We can easily have congestion within uh, the ISP's domain. It's also used, of course, to optimize uh, uh, the data forwarding and how traffic is handled within the ISP's network before it's delivered to the internet. So that is what we call traffic engineering. Traffic engineering. So now let's look at the uh, let's look at the different uh, roles. Uh, that uh, routers play within the MPLS domain. The different roles that routers play within the MPLS domain. So in the MPLS domain, we have three types of routers that you must understand. The first one is called an LER, an LER, a label edge router, a label edge router. In this particular example, RTA, RTA, and RTD are label edge routers. Uh, the purpose of the label edge router is to, number one, receive a packet uh, from a network that forwards using the IP header. After receiving the packet, 
it adds a label to that packet before forwarding it towards its destination. So that's the first function of a label edge router. The second function of a label edge router is depicted here with the router RTD. That particular purpose is to receive a packet that has an MPLS header, remove that header and forward the data using the IP header towards uh, uh, its destination that forwards data using, that is outside the MPLS domain and therefore forwards data using the IP header. So that is what the LER does. Hmm. That is what the LER does, label edge router, to either add a label or to remove the label when the packet is getting out of the MPLS domain. Hmm. Now, this particular action, this particular action of, this particular action of uh, adding a label is known as a push in MPLS, uh, known as a push label. On the other hand, the second function of an LER is known as pop. Pop is when you are removing a label. Now, the other thing that can happen within an MPLS domain is what we call a swap, is what we call a swap. Uh, now, the other type of router within an MPLS domain is known as an LSR or a label switch router, a label switch router. Uh, now, the purpose of the label switch router is to receive a labeled packet uh, and change the value of that label, then forward that packet towards its destination. In this particular example, all these routers, all these routers can act as a label switch router. In this particular example, after RTA, after RTA adds a label, it sends this particular packet to RTB. RTB performs a swap, changing the value of the label, then forwards that particular packet to RTC. RTC does the same, changes the label from 1029 to 1039, then forwards that packet to RTD. Uh, RTD is a label edge router, therefore it simply removes, it simply removes the label and forwards the data using the IP header information, which is the destination IP address. Mm. So that is what a label switch router does. Receives a labeled packet, then change the value. Sometimes it can change, sometimes it can forward it with the same value, but it, it's, still going to, it's still going to change it. Then, yes, good Daddy. morning. Daddy. Okay, just a minute, guys. Daddy. Yes, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Asante yes. Nisan. Now, uh, the last thing that you need to understand about the MPLS domain is the path, is the path via which uh, uh, the labeled packets follow within the MPLS domain. That particular path uh, is normally referred to as a label switch path. 
or an LSP, or an LSP, the path via which uh, that particular packet passes through within the MPLS domain. In this particular example, uh, the LSP is this particular path via which this packet has been forwarded to. It was forwarded from RTA, RTB, RTC, and RTD. Yeah. And one of the main advantages of MPLS is that we can do traffic engineering. We can decide to create an LSP that forwards packets uh, within this LSP. We can create another LSP that forwards packet within this route. And we can predetermine that. Mm. And therefore, we can be able to optimize uh, how, how packets are forwarded within our network. Mm. So it's important that you remember uh, most of the things that I've said uh, at this particular point. Uh, so the roles that the routers play, the actions that can be performed by each router, and lastly, the path through which uh, 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 the path through which the packet is forwarded through within the MPLS domain, which is known as an LSP or a label switch path. Okay. So now let's look at the MPLS control and forwarding plane. Uh, so generally, every router will have what we call a control plane and a forwarding plane or a data plane. Mm. A control plane normally is used by uh, specific protocols uh, to learn the routes and install the best routes in, uh, in a table. So for example, uh, you can use routing protocols to learn routes. When, when that happens, those routes, the best routes are installed in a routing table, in a routing table. And uh, that particular information is also transferred to what we refer to as the IP forwarding table in the data plane, which is simply your, 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 your routing table. Uh, so what happens when you receive a packet that is supposed to be forwarded? Uh, so this one is an incoming IP packet. So it's supposed to be forwarded using the, uh, the IP header. So the router is going to go through the routing table or the forwarding table and forward that particular packet out towards, towards its uh, destination mm. by looking at the next stop. Uh. If, for example, it is a label edge router, it can also add a label before forwarding it out. Mm. You see? Now, let's look at how the MPLS control plane and forwarding plane looks like. Now, the labels that we saw in the previous slide can be, they can be configured manually, just the same way we can, we can configure static routes in our routing tables, we configure manually. So, MPLS labels can also be configured manually, but we have a protocol that can be used to create and distribute the labels between the routers in the MPLS domain. That protocol is normally referred to as LDP, Label Distribution Protocol. Uh, now, when that particular, uh, when that particular protocol uh, forwards the labels and shares the labels between the routers, it installs that particular data in what we call a label forwarding data. So what happens is this, if an incoming packet, if an incoming packet is labeled, then you're gonna check the label forwarding table. We're going to see this in the coming slides, how it really works. So check the forwarding table, then see, am I supposed to perform a pop? So I remove the MPLS label and forward it as a normal IP packet? Or am I supposed to perform a swap and simply change 
the label value and send it towards its destination. Mm. So that is what we call the data plane or the forwarding plane. So control plane again, used to learn uh, uh, the IP routes or used to learn the labels. After learning, you install them in your forwarding table. The forwarding table resides at the data plane and that is we used to forward either a normal IP packet or a labeled IP packet. So let's look at the MPLS label format. Generally in MPLS, we have two encapsulation modes. We have two encapsulation modes. The first encapsulation mode is known as the frame mode. And the other one is known as the cell mode. Mm. So in this chapter, or in this particular course, we're only going to focus on the frame mode, on the frame mode. Mm. When, uh, when you're talking about the frame mode in terms of MPLS, mm, we, we, we simply, this is exactly what we do. We simply inject, we simply inject an MPLS header. We inject an MPLS header between the layer two header and the IP header. Uh, so this is what we call the MPLS frame mode encapsulation. So I'm also not aware how the cell mode works. So I can't really uh, give uh, more information about that. But just as examples, Ethernet networks, point to point networks uses the frame mode encapsulation uses the frame mode encapsulation. Mm. Okay. So, just like many other protocols we've looked at, uh, we've looked at so far, MPLS uh, header also is made up of a number of fields. The very first field is what we call the label field is made up of 20 bits, the label fields. Uh, so the label field is simply used to identify uh, uh, the particular label. So you saw 1029, 1039. So that value is stored here, is stored in the label field. The next field is called the experimental use field. It's made up of three bits. And it's simply used to determine the priority of the packet, the precedence of the IP packet. Mm. Then after the experimental, uh, we have the S bit, a common question in the exam. So this is called the bottom of stack field. It's, it's one bit, so it can be a zero or a one. When it's a zero, it means uh, this particular packet has more than one. It, it has another. It has another MPLS label. So some MPLS application need the use of more than one MPLS label. So you're going to have more than one MPLS header in the same packet. Uh, so when it's a zero, it means you, you have another one. So after processing the first MPLS header, you have to process the next MPLS header. Otherwise, if it is set to a one, it simply means that this is the last MPLS header. So the bottom of stack, this is the last MPLS header. So that is what the S bit is used to denote. And lastly, we have the time to leave field. The TTL field is an eight bit value that is used in a similar manner to the TTL field in an IP header and to avoid uh, 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 endless looping of MPLS packets within the MPLS domain. Uh. Okay. So this is an example where we've done MPLS label nesting. So we've simply used more than one MPLS headers in this particular, uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, example. Mm. So uh, in the frame header, we have the type field. So the type field will usually uh, uh, will usually show us 
the next protocol to which we are going to pass this packet to. So uh, the type field of the frame header can be Ethernet, it can be PPP. So when it's Ethernet or PPP, these are the hexadecimal values that are going to represent that. Uh, otherwise, it can also be an MPLS packet. So if it's an MPLS packet, it's, it's going to have that for unicast, for multicast, it's going to have that value. Similarly, for PPP, if it's an MPLS packet, it's going to have that. Uh, if it's a multicast MPLS packet, it's going to have that hexadecimal value. Mm. So in the previous slide, we talked of the S bit, or, uh, which is used to indicate whether uh, the label is the last one. So you can see in the first label, the, the S bit will be set to zero. In the second label, the S bit will be set to zero. In the last label, the S bit will be set to one, meaning this is the bottom. Uh, this is the bottom of the stack. Mm. This is the last MPLS label. Now, it is important to mention that uh, normally, normally, and in most applications, you'll only need one MPLS label for each packet. But a few MPLS applications, like when you're creating MPLS VPNs, and also when you're doing MPLS traffic engineering, you'll need to use more than one label. Mm. So like in MPLS VPN, you, you, you need to do at least uh, two labels. So the outer label is used for the public network forwarding to forward data on the MPLS domain. The in label is used to identify the, the VPN that the packet belongs to. So this packet belongs to VPN A. This packet belongs to VPN B. Uh, uh, then again, in traffic engineering, you can also use two or more label. In traffic engineering, the outmost label is used to indicate the tunnel, the traffic engineering tunnel that you've, that you've created, the LSP. Then the in label is used to indicate the destination of the packet. Uh, so you see? you might need to use uh, uh, more than a single MPLS label. And that is what we call MPLS label nesting. So let's look at the forwarding process uh, uh, and how it is done. The forwarding process is done using uh, uh, two very important uh, values. The first one is called the FEC or forwarding equivalence class. And the second one is known as the next hop label forwarding entry. So you must understand, you must understand how uh, these two values are used uh, to forward data within an MPLS domain. Now, a forwarding equivalence class is what we referred to as a data flow uh, in the previous chapters. For example, when we were doing link aggregation, we talked of the data flow. When we were doing uh, yesterday, when we were looking uh, when we were looking at IP security, uh, we talked over data flow. When we were talking about interesting traffic, capturing interesting traffic. Uh, so a data flow is simply uh, data that has the same characteristics. Most of the time, these characteristics are based on uh, either destination, the destination or the source address, uh, or the service type, or the quality of service. Mm. So data that has a similar characteristic, a common characteristics, they are coming from the same source. They are going to the same destination, is what we call in MPLS a forwarding equivalence class. Uh, a forwarding equivalence class. So this FEC is used to determine whether data is supposed to be forwarded, uh, uh, is supposed to be forwarded using an LSP, using a label switched uh, uh, path. Then the next part is what we call the next hop label forwarding entry. Uh, the NHLF is used for label forwarding. It contains the following basic information. So the next hop of the packet. So the packet has come with this with this label 1029. So if it comes in with the label 1029, then what's the next hop? 
where am I supposed to forward it to? And so that's one of the information on NH LFE. The next one is which tag operation are we supposed to perform on this particular packet, labeled packet? Are we supposed to do a push? Are we supposed to do a tag or a swap? Mm. Remember, when you're doing a swap, you are swapping the original tag with a new tag. Sorry, I'm receiving a call and therefore my internet might be unstable. Let me, let me just cut it. Okay. So can you still hear me? Yes, but we just had you and, uh, up to the point of uh, how to perform a tag operation. Okay, so the tag operation might be a push when you're adding a new tag uh, to a packet which is coming outside of the MPLS domain, popping when you are sending a packet outside the MPLS domain to a normal IP forwarding network, swapping when you are changing the label value. Mm. And I was insisting that swapping includes uh, swapping the original tag with a new tag. Uh. And other than that, the NHLFE may also contain information such as the link layer encapsulation that is used for sending the packets. So which mode? Is it the frame mode or the cell mode? Mm. Okay, so once we know about the FEC and the next top label forwarding entry, we can be able to look at this example and uh, understand what they really mean. So uh, in router A, if we type the command display MPLS, label switched path lsp include so we want to see the lsp for going to this network 10.2.0.0 slash 24 then verbose we want it to be detailed we want this report to be detailed mm. so the first value we are seeing here is the fec so the fec simply means that here we are looking at any packet any packet that is heading to this destination, we are going to treat it as a fake. We are going to treat it with the same rule. Uh, now, let's look now. Anything that is colored blue is a next hop label forwarding entry. So let's look at the first information that the NH LFE can specify. So the next hop. Uh, so we are supposed we are supposed to forward it to this next top 10.1.1.2 mm. the next thing you can see is the out interface so yes we are supposed to forward it to this next top via which interface via that particular interface then you can also see here the label operation so we are supposed to do a push what is a push we add we are supposed to add uh, 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 a label to this particular packet. Why? Because when it came in, when it came in, it did not have a label. But when it goes out, we are going to add a label to it with the value 1030. So we are performing a push. Uh, so whatever has been colored there with blue is what we call the next stop label forwarding entry. So again, the FEC is simply used to identify packets of the same characteristic so that we can determine how we are supposed to forward it, via which, via which NH LFE are we supposed to forward uh, uh, those packets. So I hope that is clear. So let's now look at, uh, sorry, uh, let's look now at how we forward data at each at each of these routers within the MPLS domain. Mm. So the very first router, uh, the label edge router here, RTA. So we want to look at that, this RTA. 
this this RTA that receives a packet uh, from a network outside the MPLS domain is normally referred to as an ingress LER. An ingress LER. So so far, uh, uh, how can I how can I call this? So MPLS domain, uh, MPLS domain. Uh, router roles. Let me just call it that. So, so far, we've talked of an LER and we've talked of an LSR. So, we have those two roles. Now, when it comes to an LER, we have an ingress. And number two, we have an egress. Egress, egress, I think. I hope I've spelled that correctly. Ingress, LER is used to do a push. On the other hand, egress, LER is used to do a pop. We know that an LSR is used to do a swap. So that is what we want to see here. Now, uh, we have... Uh, we have a table here, and uh, this particular table, uh, this particular table, is sometimes referred to as uh, an FTN. An FTN is a fake, sorry, a fake, a fake to NH LFE mm, table. So this particular table is simply used to map simply used to map a fake to an NH LFE. Sometimes when we have multiple equal paths, a single fake, uh, a single fake, for example, 10.2.0.0 can, can be associated with more than one LSP. So more than one NH LFE. Mm. So this particular table is what is used by RTA. Uh, to 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 put a label to this packet before forwarding it to the next uh, to the next uh, destination. So how how is how is that done? So RTA receives this packet. When RTA receives this particular packet, it checks the destination. So the destination is towards that network, and therefore it it checks this particular table and sees that I'm supposed to forward this packet to this next hop. So that is this particular interface, 10.1.1.2, uh, through this out interface, serial zero, this interface, through this interface. And the label operation I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to do a push. So push is I'm going to insert a label I'm going to insert a label to this particular packet. Mm. And of course, we said an HLFE might also have other details, such as the encapsulation mode that is being used to transport data. Mm. Now, the next example here is how an LSR uh, forwards data. Uh, I don't know. Okay, I cannot be able to cover that, okay. So a label switch router, so on the transit node, on the transit node, the LSR uses a table we call the incoming label map table, the ILM table, and the NH LFE table uh, to guide MPLS packet forwarding. Mm. So how, how, does, uh, how does that really happen? That is what we want to see here. So let me just have that. So the packet is sent to RTA. RTA performs a push. So the packet does not have, does not have a label. So before forwarding, it adds a label, then forwards it to RTB. RTB removes the label, 
checks. So RTB now is going to check the ILM label map, the incoming label uh, map table, uh, which is this. So let me just go back again. So here we are looking at if a label comes in, if a packet comes in with the label 1030, so it's called the in label, then apply this, uh, apply this NHLFE to it. So what does that mean? Let's look at that. Uh, let me get back my control there. So remove the label, add another label. This time is a special case where the label values are the same. So the label values can be the same, but in most instances, the label values will be, will be changed. Eh? But here it has remained the same. Then forward it. Uh, sorry, what just happened? Okay, so then forward it to the next hop. So what's the next hop? 10.1.1.6. Uh, so this guy here, 10.1.1.6, out through this interface, S3. Mm. Then what label operation are you doing? You're doing a swap. So that's why you removed, then inserted a new label. You removed the previous label and inserted a new label. Uh, so that is what will happen on RTB. Then forward it. So replace the label and then forward it to RTC. So now let's look at what happens to the uh, to the to to this particular packet when it arrives at RTC. So RTC receives it with the label 1030, then changes the label to 1032. How does it do that? Again, it looks at the ILM table. It looks at the ILM table. So if someone comes in with this particular label, 1030, forward them to this next stop. So this is the next stop. Then the out interface is that one, S003. Then the operation you're performing is a swap. So perform a swap. Mm. So that has not been animated. So you can see that we received a label, a labeled packet with the label value 1030. Then we swapped it to 1032. Then we went ahead and forwarded it to the next hop, which is RTD. Mm. So now let's see what the egress router will do, RTD. So on the egress node, the ILM table is queried to guide MPLS packet forwarding. So again, you check the in label has come in as 1032. So send it out, send it out to this interface. The out interface, has not been specified because it's the same actually as the next stop in order to deliver it to the network. Then what is the label operation we are doing? We are doing a pop. So we simply remove the MPLS header because we are sending it out outside the MPLS domain. Hmm. So let's see how that happens. So the bucket has been forwarded there. RTA will do a push. RTB will remove it, do a swap. RTC will receive, remove the label, add a new label, send it to the next stop, which is RTD. RTD will remove that particular label, look at the destination IP address in the IP header and deliver that packet to the intended destination using the IP header information. So that is how that really happens. So that is it about MPLS. Asanteni Sana for being attentive. Now we can have two volunteers take up the first, someone to take up the first question and another one to take up the next question. Wow. Uh, okay. The first one. <clears throat> yes. Which field, uh, which field in the MPLS header is used to identify the stack bottom label? Yes. Uh, be S. 
the S field. Thank you very much. Then uh, I think Joshua, you can go for the next one. Okay. Which of the following actions can be performed when packets are forwarded based on MPLS labels? Uh -huh. We have the push, pop, and swap. Very correct. Push, pop, and swap. Can you remind mm -hmm. us which routers can do a push and a pop? Which routers can do a swap? The uh, LER routers mm -hmm. can do the push and mm -hmm. the, the pop, and the LR, LSR can do the swap. Exactly. What is the name of the LER router that can do a pop? The egress. Egress, Asante san. And the other one that can do a push? The ingress. Ingress, very important. So remember those facts. You'll get easy but tricky questions like an LSR can perform a pop. Then you'll have to choose between true and false. So you have to know these details. Asante Nisana, let's now go to segment routing. <laughs> 